Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Shirley and I will be your moderator this evening. Uh, tonight's webinar is Scan and Print Master 3D Printed Digital Smiles. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Defi, who is a founding partner of the Mod Institute and an expert in dental 3D printing technology. Before we get started, I would just like to take a moment to go over some quick housekeeping. If you have a question, we'd love for you to share it with us by typing it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens, and we will address questions at the end of the webinar. CE is not available for this webinar. And um, this, uh, this presentation will be emailed out to everyone who's registered over the coming weeks. You can look forward to that. Well, with that said, uh, welcome Dr. Defi. We're so excited and thank you for being with us. I'll pass it over to you now. Thanks, Shirley. Um, I'm super excited to be here tonight. I wanna to thank Henry Shine for having me on to talk about something that I'm super passionate about, which is 3D printing and dentistry. I think we are practicing in such a unique and exciting time in dentistry. Uh, and I wanna talk about the integration between scanning and 3D printing and how you can leverage that within your practice to deliver new efficiencies, new predictabilities for uh, treatments that you're delivering. We'll talk about smile design, we'll talk about occlusal guards, we'll talk about inlays and onlays. It's gonna be a great night. Love to have any questions, please submit those to Shirley and we'll cover all of those in the end. So as Shirley mentioned, my name is Michael Defee. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the co-founders of the Mod Institute with Dr. Wally Renee in Charleston, South Carolina. This is our facility where we teach anything and everything digital dentistry. You'll also notice that we have a clinic, a two-chair clinic on the opposite side of the teaching facility where we're practicing everything that we're teaching uh, every week. And so, we're at such an exciting time because intraoral scanning has finally reached mass adoption within dental Street. COVID, COVID was bad in a lot of ways, but it was great for 3D print or for intraoral scanning adoption in the United States. So we had a huge uptick in intraoral scanner adoption in the US coming out of COVID. We went from in the 40% to around 60% in 2022. And the most recent numbers that I've seen in early 2024 is where, you know, low 70 percentage of offices that have intraoral scanners. This is so exciting for me because I've been scanning for well over a decade and I know all of the efficiencies that it can offer a practice and improve improvements in accuracy for restorations. Um, and taking the next step from intraoral scanning is you need to figure out a way to fabricate off of your intraoral scans. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. There are lots and lots of really great options for intraoral scanners on the market now. Um, from Dent Supply Serona's options with uh, Omnicam's an older version, obviously the Prime Scan, Trios 4, 5, the new Trios Core, the Medit i700, which I've been using for a couple of years. Um, they have the new i900 as well. We have the Emerald and Emerald S from Plan Mecca. There's lots and lots of great options for scanners on the markets. But the question is, is one scanner more accurate or better than the other scanners? And so this is a great study that was done at my alma mater, MUSC, by Dr. Wally Renee, my partner, and a couple other uh, faculty there, where they looked at probably the most accurate model for intraoral scanner accuracy, in my opinion, in extracted maxillas. Because a lot of scanner accuracy studies, they are using stone models and comparing accuracy for scanners over stone models. But if we think about scanners, the scanners are basically cameras, right? And so do you think the light diffraction off of a stone model is different than it is off of an actual maxilla with teeth and tissue? Yeah, it absolutely is. And so that's what I love about this study is they used an actual real world model to test the accuracy of these scanners. And when you look, you can see Emerald S, the i700, the Prime, the Trios 4, the iTero, all within about 40 to 60 microns of accuracy, cross arch, paddle, um, and on the mandible, which is totally acceptable for accuracy within any type of dentistry that you want to do especially when we look at comparing that to PBS, which is in about 37 to 40 microns of accuracy, 
you know, we know that intra oil scanning is there and it's reached what was considered the gold standard in the past in PVS or impressions. So we know we can take the step and be really assured of the accuracy that we're going to get. And so really, when you look at scanners, there's a couple of things that you need to think about now, knowing that the accuracy is essentially equivalent across. One is the UI, which is the user interface. Two is maybe the coloration and the detail on the models, if that's something that's important to you. And so looking at this slide, this is four different scanners scanning the same arch um, at the same time. And so you can see the speed is roughly equal. Maybe the prime scan is a little bit faster, but the coloration is pretty lifelike on all of the models themselves. And so you know that all of these scanners would be acceptable and usable within your practice and give you a result that would be clinically acceptable in any situation. And so I wanna talk about a couple of the scanners that we use every day in our practice um, and that I'm gonna showcase on later on in this presentation. And so the first one is the Prime Scan. And so the Prime Scan is a great scanner. Um, it's made by Dent Splicerona. It has a great depth of field in the scan. And so that's something I'll talk about in, on the next slide. But this is probably the biggest value add for the Prime Scan um, compared to other scanners is the depth of field that it offers. It's just superior than any other scanner on the market. It's very accurate, like you saw in the study that we reviewed. 40 to 60 microns for pretty much anything that you want to scan. It's probably the best for scanning edentulous arches when you're really focused on soft tissue detail. We've scanned with lots of different scanners and trying to scan an edentulous arch, which is probably the most difficult thing that you can scan, the Prime Scan is probably the easiest scanner to do it with. There's other scanners that certainly you can do it with, especially if you're skilled and very experienced in scanning, but the Prime Scan is probably going to be the easiest there. And I'm gonna talk about some prices in this presentation, but these are just estimations. Um, and if you want a more detailed price, please reach out to a rep for your, um, who can give you an actual quote for what it would look like to purchase one of these. Um, but the Prime Scan is gonna be a, a little bit more on the expensive side, probably around 40K. And you're gonna pay yearly maintenance fees of around $2,400 or so. Um, you know, so it is on the price you're in, but you're paying a little bit um, for a lot of the technology development from Dent Splicerona. The depth of field, which I mentioned earlier, <coughs> that means that the scanner can be farther away from the object that it's scanning and still capture the data accurately. And so why is that an advantage? It's an advantage, let's think about, as, let's imagine that you're prepping a second molar, say number 18, patient has third molars, and you're trying to get accurate data around those contacts. The prime scan with the larger depth of field allows you to back the camera off and rotate it around the actual uh, contact and be able to scan that more um, easier probably than some of the scanners that have less depth of field where you have to be closer into the object, especially if the teeth are particularly rotated. <coughs> Excuse me. The TRIOS 5, which is probably my favorite scanner and one that I'm using the most chair side, um, is also a really great scanner and a great option for any office. It's also extremely accurate. It's you know, the, the study that we looked at was with the TRIOS 4 and the TRIOS 5. There's not a lot of accuracy studies out with it yet, but it is as accurate or better than the TRIOS 4. So we know it's perfectly acceptable clinically. It also scans soft tissue well. And I've scanned a lot of edentulous arches with the TRIOS 5 <coughs> in very easy and very easily, um, a little more technique sensitive than the prime scan, but definitely learnable for most practitioners. Um, it's light and very ergonomic. This is the one thing that's probably is the biggest value add for me with the TRIOS 5, is it just, you use it in your hands so easily. <clears throat> it just feels really well when you're scanning full arches. It's wireless, unlike the prime scan, which there is pluses and minuses to that. You know, if you have your scanning computer close, you rarely have issues with connectivity. 
but if you are have your scanning computer a little bit farther away, sometimes that can be an issue. Um, it's never an issue for me, um, but it's definitely something to keep in mind if you're going to go the wireless route is you need to have your scanning computer pretty close to where you're scanning. And cost-wise, you're going to be around in the $25,000 range to get a Trios. And, um, you know, the first year maintenance fees, I think, are covered by Trios. And if you want to have maintenance fees after that, it's around $2,300 a year. But once again, I'd reach out to a rep and, you know, confirm those numbers. These are just estimates. <laughs> the Medit i700 is also a really great scanner, especially if you're looking at something at a lower price point. It's also very accurate. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, you know, probably I would say the margins uh, on difficult preparations can be a little bit less clear on the i700 when compared to the Trios or the Prime Scan, but definitely works well for pretty much every indication and definitely usable in those situations as well. It's also light and ergonomic. The price for the Medit is going to be in the sixteen to eighteen thousand dollar range, and outside of the Clinic CAD, which is their or their Medit Clinic, I think is what they call it, their connectivity um, cloud software fee. There's no uh, ongoing fees for this scanner. Uh, I think that's about a dollar a month or something. It's very very low. Um, that's probably one of the things that I, I would say are not my favorite about the Medit, and the fact that they run all the the scan uh, recapitulations are done in the cloud and sometimes it can take a long time to get your scans to actually generate into models um, if it's a busy clinic time but definitely still a very good scanner and something you should keep on the radar for yourself you know but one thing we need to talk about with all these scanners is scan patterns and so if you're new to scanning this may be a term that you haven't heard before if you've been scanning for a while then i'm sure this is something you've heard before but the way scanners work is they're either taking lots of little uh, photographs or pictures um, as they scan arches or they're taking video and then they're using a computer algorithm to stitch all of those uh, data together to make a model. And so what we know is the way you give the data to the computer to make the model itself can affect how accurate the model is. <clears throat> and so this was a study that was done by Dr. Rene, um, Dr. Evans, and a couple other faculty at MUSC looking at comparing four scan patterns with four different scanners to see if one was superior for accuracy or precision and for speed as well. And so these are the four scan patterns they tested. And what they found was that this scan pattern was the most accurate and also the fastest scan pattern to use for scanning full arch. And so this is a variation of the scan pattern that we use clinically every day at the Mott Institute and that I've used for a number of years it's the five overlapping passes scan pattern. And so what you're doing is you're giving the computer the data in a way that it can put it back together in a very accurate model. We're looking at 42 and a half microns for a full arch scan, which is you know within five microns of what was tested for PBS in the study that we looked at. We know that's extremely accurate and definitely clinically acceptable for any indication that we want to use it for. And so with the advent of scanning, which has been around for, you know, probably going on about 30 years at this point um, for more widespread use, that really drove a milling revolution where we're looking at three axis milling chair side or five axis milling in dental labs where we're fabricating restorations off of the scans that we're getting and keeping everything a fully digital workflow. And so even now, what we see is about 90% of all fixed restorations in the USA are currently milled. But I think probably that's going to change as we go through this new iteration of a fabrication revolution with 3D printing. And so 3D printing has been around in other industries for since the early 80s is really when it was invented. But we really start to see the advent and the growth of 3D printing 
in the mid 2010s, you know, with more 3D printers coming on the market, like the Form 1, my first printer was a Form 2. Uh, the Form 1 was released in 2014. But the early resins that we were using, <clears throat> they were really bad, honestly. <clears throat> they were hard to use. They were ugly. They were brittle. They looked like toys that came out of a Cracker Jack box. But the beautiful thing that we're experiencing now is there's a new resin revolution where we've got a lot of interest from a lot of companies in improving the resins that we're using to print, to chair side print with Sprint Ray, with uh, PacDent, with Form Labs, all introducing new resins and releasing new resins that are more accurate, that are more aesthetic that have better wear properties. It's just really a great time to be interested in 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions that I get often is what can I print? And I think probably a better question is what can I print? Because pretty much any indication you can think about in dentistry, you can integrate 3D printing in that indication. Veneers, inlays, onlays, crowns, dentures, bridges, occlusal guards, models, surgical guides, shell crowns, mock-ups, any number of things. And we'll talk about a few of those indications in this webinar tonight. And so I wanna talk about a couple of the printers that I'm gonna cover um, uses for in this uh, webinar, but there's a couple other good ones on the market as well. Uh, the Accurate Soul, which is the one on the far left of the screen. Sprint Ray's ecosystem, which is the white printer, is the Pro 55S, and their newest one is the Pro 2. Form Lab's new offering is the Form 4 on the far right. Dead Spice Rona also has the Prime Print. Uh, Masiga is more of a lab printer, but it's also one that we have in our office and use. And so let's talk about a little bit of the differences in these printers. <laughs> and advantages uh, of one over the other. So the Accurate Soul, you know, so the cost that I have there is just an estimate, but it's for the full system of the printer, the wash, and the cure unit. And so whatever printer you decide is most appropriate for your uh, office, I really recommend buying the system because the system is what gets tested for the mechanical properties of the resins um, that are printed. So the printer, the wash, and especially the cure unit are really important to pair together because if you're using other cure units or nail boxes or people are curing 3D printed objects with all different kinds of things, you're not going to have the same mechanical properties. You're potentially going to have harmful pieces within the resin that's not cured that you're putting in your patient's mouth, and we definitely don't want to be doing any of that. And so the Accurate Soul is a great little printer. Um, it has three different build plate sizes, large, medium, and small, which allows you to print it at different speeds by focusing in the actual uh, printing size. Uh, it can work really great for same day restorations as long as you're only doing a few. Um, when you get past doing more than about three or four restorations, the build plate size on the small plate is not large enough really to print there. And so then you're at the medium plate, which the plate's going to be, uh, it's going to slow down your speed quite a bit for that. Um, Accurate Soul is an open platform in that any resin manufacturer can validate their resin on Accurate, and then you can use it and you can print it on it. Um, the Sprint Ray system is a semi-closed system in that the majority of the resins that are validated on that uh, plat on their platform are Sprint Ray resins themselves. There are a few third party resins that are validated on Sprint Ray's platform. <laughs> they recently introduced a partnership with Ivaclar, which I'm super excited about that Ivaclar is going to be developing resins for their platform. The Pro 55S is a projector based uh, 3D printer on the left. It's a white one, it's their older platform. Um, and they have three different build plate sizes for that as well. The standard, the arch kit, and the crown kit, which like the Accurata, the different build plate sizes allow you to print at different speeds. 
Um, the crown kit, which is their speed plate, is probably about three three to four times the size of Accuretta's smaller build plate. So doing larger cases with same day printing is a lot more uh, reachable for the Pro 55S than, um, than it is on the Accurate Soul. <clears throat> the Pro 2 is their newest printer where they switched the wavelength from 405 nanometer wavelength curing to 385, which will help a lot with accuracy because 385 uh, is a higher um, energy and it's going to allow the cure depth to improve and you need less photo initiators in the resins. So they're, they're able to be a lot more accurate when you're cured at that wavelength. Um, the build plate obviously is very large. You can see it in this photo. They are introducing a smaller one to focus on speed with that, but their newest one, which is not released yet, is the Midas, which is really going to be their speed printer. Um, outside of doing some beta testing for that, I'm excited to get the um, full release version and <clears throat> test on that. Formlab's newest printer is the Form 4, which is what we have pictured here. We have one of these in our office and have been um, really excited to use it. Formlabs has really focused on speed with this printer specifically. Um, Formlabs has always been known as an accurate printer. Like I mentioned, I had a Form 2 as my first printer, uh, which was their second release. But they work on an SLA technology, which is where a laser traces out each layer of the print itself. And so the prints were very, very slow. Everything was a multi-hour print. Um, they've changed the way they're using the laser in this um, printer specifically in, in that it's a masked SLA technology. And so it's allowed the speed uh, to increase quite a lot. Um, and so it's, it's definitely a lot more reachable for doing same day type dentistry for this printer. They're still in the process of validating a lot of resins on the printer so the resin profiles are currently a little bit limited um, as far as tooth resins themselves, um, but definitely a very accurate printer and a very, um, you know, a, a very speedy printer as well. Um, <clears throat> Price-wise, you know, Formlabs for a system is going to be, is kind of at the lowest end here. Accurate Soul is in the middle and Sprint Rays on the top end. These are all estimates. You can reach out to a rep and get a more uh, you know, definitive price depending on where you want to focus there. Um, Resin-wise, which is the biggest thing for 3D printing, I would have to say that Spurt Ray is probably leading the pack as far as resin release and resin chemistry at this point. That certainly could change at any time, but Onyx Tough 2 is probably my favorite resin for printing, both for aesthetics and wear properties at this point. Um, but the beauty of being in a fast moving industry is there is uh, innovations and new technologies coming on the market all the time. And so I'm just really excited to see what's next. <laughs> One cool thing about the Formlabs printer is the way that they deliver resin, which is a little bit different than both Accuretta and the Sprint Ray, is they use an auto dispense model from their capsules. And so it makes it a little bit cleaner. Um, and a little bit uh, less messy to deliver and print from. Um, you know, it, it, certainly it's not a game changer, I would say, but it's a really nice feature where it pre-measures the resin that you need to do for your prints. Um, and you can keep the bottles uh, a little bit less uh, messy and more organized. But the question is, how do we connect the dots, right? So we've got scans of preps or implant scan bodies, or any number of things. And we've got printers, which make prosthetics. But how do we close the gap and connect those two together? And if you've been scanning for a while, this is probably like a really silly question for you, but the answer is really in design. <clears throat> and so there's a lot of options on the market for either software to design with, or you can use a lab. We are big ExoCAD users at the Mod Institute. I think it's the best software for advanced design. Um, I do all of my own design. And so that's the software that I'm using for 90% of what I'm doing. 3Shape Design Studio is also a great software. Clinix is um, a more limited indication software that is a lot more approachable in price. I think MedicCAD 
is either very cheap or or free. I'm not completely sure. I, I haven't really used it. True Abutment has the trust software, which I have been using some for different things like implant crowns. Uh, I've played a little bit with dentures and night guards. Theirs is also free, which is really nice. Um, but for advanced design, in my opinion, ExoCAD is, is pretty hard to beat at this point. Um, I'm going to talk about some design and show some videos of design in this webinar, um, but it's not going to really be focused on design. If you want to learn more about that, you probably should, uh, you know, come to one of our courses where we'll teach that or take one of our online courses. The other thing that we need to talk about with 3D printing that I see is one of the biggest frustrations and maybe the biggest misunderstandings with 3D printing um, either for people who are coming from the milling world or they're new to you know fabrication at all is nesting. And so nesting is the strategy for how you have your object oriented on the build plate and how these little points that you see in this photo uh, support tips, support the print that you're building. So if we think about 3D printing, 3D printing is built by layers, right? So each layer is cured and builds on top of the other. And so we need these little support tips to help support and prevent drooping for the resin because it's liquid, right? Can move all over the place. And if you don't support something and orient something properly, unlike milling, where as long as you get your sprue in the right place and the mill finishes uh, properly, you know it's going to be pretty much accurately milled. If you're printing, many times you can get a print that will finish successfully. But if it wasn't nested properly, it's not going to be accurate and you're going to be banging your head on a wall wondering why it didn't fit. We'll talk about some tips and tricks in this webinar for the different indications that we're going to go over. But Wally and I wrote a guide called the 3D Printing Nesting Guide, which you can download from our website uh, for free that talks a little bit more in depth about nesting strategies for a lot of indications. If you're into 3D printing, I'd really recommend downloading that and memorizing it. It's gonna save you a lot of headache for getting successful 3D prints. And so the first thing I wanna talk about is occlusal guards because occlusal guards, I think, if you're new to 3D printing, is the easiest and the biggest ROI to get you off the ground right out of the gate. But there's three questions we really need to answer in regards to 3D printed occlusal guards before we can determine if these are really ready for prime time use in our practice. One is the comfort. Are they going to be comfortable for our patients? Because one thing we know with occlusal guards is if they're not comfortable, the patient is 100% not going to wear it. And that is a failure for us. And it's a failure for our patient. Strength, are they strong enough that they're not going to break all over the place for patients who are really aggressive grinders? And where, are they gonna last and hold up over time for patients who are really stressing the guards a lot? And so for comfort, these are really my three kind of favorite go-to resins for printing acrutal guards. Night Guard Flex 2, which is a sprint ray resin, Key Split Soft, which is a key, it's a key print resin. Um, and they are, this resin is probably the one that's been on the market the longest and is the most researched. And then the Comfort uh, Dental LT resin, which is a four months resin. These are all great resins that are really well developed and well researched. Any one of these you could use in your practice and be successful. But one thing I do want to talk about is the soft or comfort or flex that they have in this name because it's a term that was come up with by marketers that sometimes I think us dentists get nervous about hearing soft where we think, oh, well, that means it's a squishy guard like an uh, athletic mouth guard. Well, it's not. What that really means is these are thermoplastic materials where if you put them in hot water, they can be formable chair side, which is a great property to have if you have minor misfits at delivery, you can fix them very, very easily. But once the guard is at room temperature or even uh, you know within the mouth, it's very hard and very much like what you would typically think is a hard occlusal guard. And so when we talk about flexural strength, really the way 
the ISO standard works for testing that is with the three or four point bend test. And so let's look at this uh, at, at a study where they use three point bend tests to compare conventionally fabricated splints, subtractively fa fabricated splints, and additively fabricated splints. So for the three-point bend test, there is uh, ISO standards around the specifications for how long and thick <clears throat> and wide the actual printed piece that you're going to test is. So they printed according to those standards. It's supported on each end. And then in the middle, you're putting pressure on it until a certain amount till you look for it to fail. And so in this study, like I mentioned, they looked at conventional subtractive and additive with 3D printed or additive being on the far right, the conventional being on the far left, and the milled or subtractive on the middle. And so what do we see? The conventionally fabricated sprint had the lowest flexural strength. The highest was with the subtractive and the additive was in the middle. But the additive was within an error bar, which are those big bars that you see within the green bars. <clears throat> of the actual strength of the subtractive. And so whether you're used to uh, fabricating splints conventionally with ac acrylic or milling them, you can be very comfortable in saying that if you're 3D printing them, you're gonna be well within the same strength of those. And as long as you uh, are focused on maintaining thickness, you're not gonna have to worry about these splints breaking. <clears throat> looking at wear, the way this study looked at testing wear is they used a, an enamel antagonist. So basically they took a tooth and they shaped it in a way that they wanted to um, actually measure indentations within these uh, samples that they developed. They put it in a load tester and they tested two different 20 Newton load and 50 Newton loads over 2 million cycles, which is about, uh, you know, a four to five year range of what is considered uh, an appropriate model. They tested the same samples, conventional, subtractive, and additive. And what do we see? At 20 newtons, they were all pretty much exactly the same. At 50 newtons, the conventional wore more than the subtractive and more than the additive. The additive wore actually less than the subtractively fabricated splint, but it's within the error bar for what was actually tested within the sample. And so for where we know that 3D printed fabricated splints are certainly acceptable from a wear perspective as well. One thing to talk about is re in regards to nesting for 3D prints is the build angle, because this is the biggest thing that can affect the accuracy or the fit of these type of appliances. Um, and so in this side, we're looking at three different kind of common build angles for 3D printed splints. The one on the left would be considered zero or flat. The one in the middle is 45 to 60 degrees, which is probably the most commonly programmed angulation of build uh, in uh, different slicer softwares. And then the one on the right is 90 degrees or um, you know straight vertical. And so what the studies tell us is the 45 degree, 45 to 60 degree tends to have the best mechanical properties for build angle when compared to zero or 90. Um, <clears throat> but the zero degree tends to be the most accurate and the 90 degree tends to be the least accurate. The advantage of the 90 degree is if you look at where the support tips are, those little wires that come up from the bottom onto the splint themselves, the finishing or what you need to do to prepare the splint for delivery is very low compared to 45 or six, uh, 45 or zero degrees because you have no support tips that are actually on the occluding side of the splint itself. Um, there are some, splint, some printers that cannot print 90 degrees accurately at all that would ever fit. And I mostly print mine at zero degrees because I'm usually doing my printed splints the same day that I'm delivering in case so the patient doesn't have to come back. And printing, the speed is always determined by the Z-axis or the height. And so you can tell on the left, obviously the flat has the lowest height compared to the other build angles. 
The other thing that is important when you're doing 3D printed occlusal guards or any type of digital occlusal guard is having uh, the accurate bite record, the centric relation record. This is our 3D printed mod jig. Um, you know, it's a variation of a Lucia jig with some different um, things added in to allow for better fit and a better indexing. Um, you can download this on our website. And so this is a video of me using that and showing how to actually take a centric correlation record using it. So the first thing we're going to do is we need to index it or fit it to the front teeth of the patient. And so I'm mixing up some putty here and I'm going to mush that in. And so the little features that we have designed into that allow it to hold retentively. I'm going to place that in the patient's mouth and I'm going to spread the putty out to make sure I get good stability. I'm using what's called a whale tail right now. It helps me to align the jig so that it's parallel to the occlusal plane. And then I'm pressing the putty up to make sure that the putty is not going to be in the way of the occluding surfaces of the mandibular teeth for when I'm actually going to take my bite record. <clears throat> So the putty's hard now, and so this technique's very easy. You just put in occlusal paper, you have the patient grind forward, grind back, tap, tap, tap. And where they tap at the back is the centric relation record. The patient needs to be inclined at a 45 or greater angle for this to be accurate. You can't have the patient laying straight back. <clears throat> Once you have your mark, then the other thing that is really nice about this because it's 3D printed is you can bond composite directly to it. So after you check that you have your mark indexed uh, appropriately, I'm using a little, I'm gonna use a little bonding agent that has MDP in it um, because that will help to bond to the printed material. And then I'm gonna use composite to index or hold the position that I want my bite record to be taking at so that once I start scanning, the patient can't start moving around <clears throat> uh, when I'm scanning and I know that I'll have an actual accurate bite record for what I'm trying to do. And so then I'm gonna get that, get her guided back into the position I'm gonna press that up against the teeth and I'm gonna cure it. And so let's look at some cases together. So this first case, the technique was done exactly how I just showed you. This is what it looks like in the mouth. I'm measuring to make sure I have at least two and a half millimeters of clearance posterior. And then I'm just going to scan. This is scan with the prime scan. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, I always scan the palate on the maxilla because you never know when you need that data for matching. Um, but very fast and uh, easy to do there. This is probably about a three to four minute scan for both arches and the bite. With the prime scan, I'm always scanning both sides for the bite because I want to make sure to get as accurate as possible. And then we're into Exacad to do our design. The real time, this is a three and a half minute design for me. Uh, you know, it's obviously sped up a little bit because you guys don't want to see me design for three and a half minutes. But this is what's happening when you're doing uh, sending off for a flat plane night guard to any lab or any AI service. Uh, it's definitely, you can do it faster yourself than you can upload your files to those services. This is what our final design looked like. There we have printed. This is printed out of Comfort LT resin in the Formlabs printer. It's about 35 minutes to print this uh, occlusal guard. And there we have delivered perfect fit. Occlusion is pretty much perfectly what I designed it with. Um, super, super predictable, super, super easy. You should be able to do these with almost no adjustments chair side if you follow this type of workflow. This is another case. This was actually an all on X case for me. Um, the patient was an extensive grinder. You can see a lot of the wear facets on her teeth. So we made an occlusal splint the same day that I delivered the all on X prosthetic. You can see index to the mandibular teeth like I showed in the instruction video. 
this is our scanning. This was done with the Trios. Um, also a very fast scanner, very easy to use. Um, with the Olinex, you know, it's a little bit more tricky and it's not dentate because you have to connect the tissue to the prosthetic or the software might start trying to start deleting that. Um, you know, here we are scanning the lower arch. I love uh, the fact about the Trios in that it allows you to scan two bytes, um, making sure that things are very, very accurate with your bytes. Um, so we're going to scan both sides for our bytes, and it's going to register them at two different bytes. <coughs> And then we designed it just like the last one. There we have delivered. You can see pretty much perfect fit. Um, and the patient loved the fact that she didn't have to come back. We did everything one day um, in you know, a little bit over an hour in appointment, delivered a final all in X uh, and made an inclusive guard. This printed about 27 minutes. It was printed out of key, sp uh, key Splint Soft on the Sprint Ray 55S. Uh, actually, it was the breast cancer version. It was a little bit pink, um, as you can see there. And so, as I mentioned earlier, big ROI for these procedures. If you're taking records, it should be 30 minutes or less. Definitely shouldn't be any more than that. The majority of that time should be delegated. You should scan the bite, make the bite record and scan the bite record. But your staff should be doing pretty much everything else. Uh, if you're going to do the delivery same day, probably an hour, maybe 45 minutes if you're really fast. Um, but, you know, it's about $2.50 to print. And, you know, depending on what you charge your patient, anywhere from three to $600 for an appliance. Uh, and if they lose it or break it, you can even do a warranty because it costs you $2.50 to print the same thing again, which is basically nothing. Keys for success for 3D printed occlusal guards. You've got to take the bite record upright, like we talked about. It needs to be in an open vertical bite record. And you need about two and a half millimeters of minimum thickness to make sure that you have the thickness needed that the splint won't fracture. 3D printed restorations are probably one of the most uh, controversial things I think that you could 3D print. Um, but, you know, we have printed and delivered lots and lots of these. And I would say the majority of these are holding up very, very well. But you can make the decision if this is appropriate for your practice at this point, or if you want to wait a little bit to get some more longer term studies on these 3D printed restorations. Let's look at a little bit of data together, and then we'll look at some cases that I've done. You know, so for 3D printed restorations compared to direct composites to compared to milled resin ceramics, the base chemistry is the same. There's nothing really new or revolutionary about this, other than the fact that we're fabricating it in a little bit of a different manner. So it's not anything like totally different for your practice itself. It's a chemistry that you should be very familiar with for your restorative materials. And in 2013, uh, the CDT code was changed to allow milled restorations with more than 50% ceramic or inorganic filler particles to be billed as ceramic. And so many of you probably have been delivering milled ceram milled resin ceramic restorations for maybe close to a decade at this point, and it probably had pretty good success. This is a study from Dennis Fassbinder um, looking at five uh, year follow-up for some milled resin ceramic restoration. And look, you know, A is day of, B is one, C is three, D is five year, it's holding up pretty well. I mean, I would consider that acceptable for pretty much any restoration. This was a, a systematic review and meta-analysis where they compared five-year um, success rates for ceramics, for hybrids, which are resin ceramics, and for composites. And they found that the hybrids or the resin ceramics, which is analogous to what we're 3D printing, had the same clinical success as the ceramics themselves. And so as part of that literature base, the CDT code chain was changed in January of 2023 to say that 3D printed restorations like milled restorations, if they contain over 50% inorganic filler, they can be coded as ceramic. And so that's why you've seen a lot of the manufacturers focus on getting uh, resins that are more than 50% filled, and you've seen a big push and kind of interest in doing these type of restorations. 
And so I would say the early studies are pretty promising. This is a study done by Zimmerman, 2019, where they looked at comparing 3D printed to V-Dynamic to Emacs CAD for flexural strength. And so what they found was that the 3D printed was as strong or stronger than Emacs, which is pretty surprising, right? I've delivered thousands of Emacs restorations and you probably have as well. It's a great restorative material. But to see that the 3D printed is as strong and I don't really have to worry about fracture, it's definitely very, very uh, reassuring to me. And so we talk about nesting these type of inlays and onlays, which is the most common way that I'm 3D printing uh, permanent restoratives. Um, there's a couple of things that we have to think about. One, you obviously always want the fitting surface focused up. You don't want to be finishing with support tips on the fitting surface of your restoration. And number two, you need to have support tips certainly around all the edges of the restoration. Um, and if you have uh, you know, more flat areas within the occlusal grooves, you wanna have support tips there. But if it's at about a 40 to 45 degree angle, then you could probably could do without support tips. Um, but you can check out our guide and you know, look at a little bit more detailed instruction on nesting those. And so this is one of my cases. You can see really large composite restoration in this patient. Um, there is a non-adaptable contact right there, which has caused a fracture on the distal marginal ridge. And now the patient has got some recurrent decay. And so the cool thing about TRIOS and PrimeScan has this, a couple other scanners do as well, is you can scan a pre-op and then you can scan your just your prep once the prep is done and it will fit the prep to that scan. <clears throat> and so you can scan your bite record pre-op before the patient's numb while they're setting up and getting them and get the most accurate bite record possible. And so why is that important? So this study looked at the influence of di different dental chair backrest inclination positions to see if it affected the bite records at all. And so what they found was they tested basically completely flat, which is 180, 120, which I would say is about a 45 degree angle or 90, which is straight up. Going from completely laid back to completely set up, the, the position of the mandibular anterior teeth moved a millimeter and a half. Going from 45 degrees to straight up, they moved about a half millimeter. So do you, are most of you probably doing your bite records after you've done preparations with the patient completely laid back in the chair? Probably, I know I was for a long time. And that's probably one of the reasons why I always had problems with occlusion when I was doing my bite records like that, always making adjustments. And so it's an important thing to think about and to know if you wanna be successful and do these efficiently to take your bite records like that. So for this patient, this is the prep that's completely done. And so this is what I talked about. We're, here we are just scanning the prep, making sure we get all our margin, all our line angles, all our contacts really, really well. <clears throat> And then we're going to design that and print it. This is printed on the 55S uh, crown kit with 11 minute print. A little bit of finishing is going to look like that. And then that's what it looks like delivered intraorally. And so this is a cool case, right? Looking at one, two, the fit really, really nice. I've always had good fits with prints. Um, but where the real efficiencies come for, uh, with the 3D prints is doing multiple units because anything you can fit on the build plate, you can print the same speed, whether it's one or whether it's 15 restoration. And so that's a big advantage of printing over milling. And so this was a quadrant case um, where we did three restorations. The total print time for these was 10 minutes, right? Huge advantage. Um, I probably couldn't even place three composites in 10 minutes. I certainly couldn't place three composites in there 10 minutes. Um, and you certainly wouldn't have the value, uh, the beautiful anatomy and perfect contacts the way they would if I 3D printed them. 
this is an older case that I did uh, where we also looked at doing some quadrants uh, with the accurate of soul. This is printed out of ruined sculpture resin, but got everything good and isolated. So this is a real-time design for this, um, is what this looks like to be designed in ExoCAD. So this was a three-unit case with uh, two buckle pits as well. And, you know, I love design. I'm very passionate about it. I realize that maybe it's not your, uh, it doesn't fit within your practice workflow, and I think that's totally fine. But I think you need to understand what's involved in these processes so you know what you need to send to your lab or to your designer to get the most accurate result back so that you're going to be able to do clinical workflows predictably and accurately and work really well for your practice. So there we are. This is real time. You know, this is what, five minutes or actually a lot less. There we are printed. There we are delivered. Really beautiful case. Really proud of that. The fit really, really nice. So the ROI for this can be huge, just depending on how many units you're doing. But, you know, for a quadrant, I would say you should be able to probably do that in about 60 minutes, de depending on how fast you prep. But once you prep and maybe you scan or maybe your staff scans, you should be walking out of the room and they should be designing, printing, getting everything ready for you to come back in, submit those. Um it costs about two and a half dollars to print three to four units. Um, and your cost of patient. Anywhere from six hundred to a thousand dollars, I think whatever you think is appropriate or whatever your contract fee is. <coughs> but definitely a big value add for your practice. And I would much, much rather have printed in laser on laser in, in my mouth than I would have direct composite. There's really no question about it for me. Keys for success are these have to be bonded. You cannot submit these. They will not be successful. You have to adhesively bond these just like you would any direct composite. Take your bite record upright and pre-op before you're numb so it's the most accurate. Patient selection. You don't want to be delivering printed restorations in patients who have a history or are abusing alcohol because alcohol is detrimental to printed restorations and you're just really not setting yourself up for success if you do that. And proper post-processing, you need to have the curing unit that the resin was validated on to use in your workflow. So whatever printer you buy, make sure you buy the curing unit that pairs with that printer. Smile mock-ups are probably one of the favorite things that we do in our office. These are game changers for the uh, acceptance of cosmetic dentistry within your practice because they allow the patient to actually see in their mouth, what the dentistry is going to look like. So like this patient, she came in with concerns about the bonding on eight and nine. We talked about her concerns with her smile. We did a mock-up in about 10 minutes. We printed it in about another 10 to 12 minutes. We tried it in. You take a photo and you show it to the patient with what their new smile could potentially look like. This is so much easier than the way I've done it in the past where I'm waxing up on models and I've got photos that I've altered, and I'm in a room with a patient like pointing to a model, pointing to a photo, and their head's going this and that. They're trying to figure out what I'm actually saying and what it's actually going to look like for them. This is such a humongous game changer. So let's look at this patient. She came to see us also with concerns about bonding on eight and nine that she had chipped it as, as a child. It was starting to discolor and look dull. She also was um, interested in getting a wider smile. And so we did a digital mock-up using ExoCAD. And so ExoCAD's nice because we can actually do our wax up on the photos and the models that we uh, uh, acquire digitally as opposed to trying to do them on stone models and equate that to what it's going to look like in a photo. And so that is really the beauty for me of doing digital wax up and how it's really changed the way that I think about cosmetic dentistry as far as putting teeth in the proper place and knowing that the wax up is going to look as good on the model as it is when I deliver it in real life. 
And so we printed these about 150 microns thick, which is totally doable with 3D printed. And that's what the mock-up looked like in the patient's mouth. She loved it, wanted to do the veneers. So we went ahead and printed these on the Accurate of Soul out of Rodin Sculpture. This was about a 51 minute print for these 10 veneers. We did some characterization and look at, at 100, these were printed about 200 microns thick. Look at the translucency on that printed veneer. It's almost like a contact lens porcelain veneer, but it didn't cost you $1,000 a unit. It's just beautiful. And so these, like the inlays and onlays, need to be printed, uh, need to be bonded as well. So we etch our enamel. We're using our bonding agent, bonded them in. This is what they look like day of delivery. Patient was ecstatic. This is one year follow up. Um, you know, so you can see this is before any polishing. Uh, a little bit of luster is lost on those, but definitely much better than any. Uh, composite veneer that I've ever done. Some of the characterization is gone, but the tissue health is really beautiful. Look at that beautifully healthy tissue around those veneers. This is two years. This is also without polish, so a little bit more wear. Um, definitely some of the characterization has continued to wear off there, but like I said, definitely holds up better than any other composite veneer that I've done. <clears throat> the ROI for these and the saving on your neck is pretty big as well. You know, so if you're doing a mock-up just for cosmetic case acceptance, you know, that should be probably a 90-minute appointment for you to take your records, uh, do your design, print, and try it in. Or you could do it at two appointments if you like. If you're doing the veneers with the same day, which we often do as well, um, you can mock-up, print, characterize, and deliver the veneers in about two hours. Um, Cost of prints anywhere from fifteen to twenty dollars, just depending on what resin you're using. Um, cost of patient, is, you know, depending on what you want to charge per unit, we say you charge probably about a half of what you would charge for a ceramic or porcelain veneer, which for us is about eight hundred to a thousand dollars a unit. So for ten units, you you know you're somewhere in about eight to ten thousand dollar range. That can be a big boost for your practice, and it definitely, I mean, you could charge a lot less than that if you'd like as well, because the costs are much lower. Can help patients in your practice who normally wouldn't be able to afford cosmetic dentistry be able to get cosmetic dentistry. And that is a huge practice builder for you to be able to meet patients where they are financially and deliver a service that is profitable for your practice and that you can be proud of. Keys for success, just like inlays and onlays, have to be bonded. No question about it. Isolation. You need really good isolation for bonding these cases because you don't want any marginal staining that's going to show up um, at the one or two year mark. Patient selection. Same thing. You don't want to be delivering these on patients who drink a lot of alcohol because it will degrade them very fast. You also want to caution your patients that they shouldn't be getting uh, cleanings with coarse profi paste because it will uh, scar up and damage the luster on the veneers. And you need to follow proper post-processing. Let's look at another case. So this is a case where we just did a mock-up and actually ended up doing veneers in ceramic. But as you can see, this patient came in, uh, he was getting married, he wanted to have a better smile, but you can see we've got a lot of things going on. Canon maxilla, some two size discrepancies, some diastemas. Um, you know, we ended up putting him in clear aligners for a time, but he wasn't the most compliant. But that day he came in, what we did was we did a mock-up, same day, printed out um, what our mock-up was, and we're gonna end up trying that in to go ahead and show the patient what we think is realistic for him and that is achievable with his smile. And so that's what it looks like tried in. He was very happy and ready to, ready to get started with treatment. And so we did the clear aligners, like I mentioned, he wasn't super compliant. So we ended up preparing the teeth um, when it got closer to his wedding day. This is scanned with the medit after the teeth are prepared.
And then the beauty of doing digital mockups is you can save a lot of the orientation and the mockup that you do initially if you're doing final restorative work and use that as a guide or even a direct copy if you want um, for moving forward with the final designs. So here we are marking margins, getting our tooth shapes adapted and perfected for where they need to be. And we're gonna do a little bit of fine tuning, make them look a little bit more realistic and a little bit less like butter beans, a little bit more like natural teeth, checking our thicknesses. Then we're gonna finish our design. And we're gonna mill and characterize those and that's what we look like at delivery. So pretty big improvement for him. I think we're very, very proud of that case and the way we're able to, to finish it out. Very, very tough case, I think. You know, it was all made possible by 3D printing and getting him on board with the cosmetic treatment for where we were trying to go with his case. The other thing, which for me has been a big game changer for how I approach uh, full mouth comprehensive dentistry is using 3D printing to make full mouth temporaries. So for any of you who've been doing comprehensive full mouth rehab dentistry, you probably dread just like I do the point of making the temporaries after you've been prepping for two to four hours or however long it takes you to prep one or two arches. It would often take me more time to make temporaries out of bisacryl and my stents than it would to actually prepare the teeth themselves. And so with 3D printing and digital design, you can make that a lot easier. <laughs> you can still make your putty stents off of your digital designs and make your temporaries that way if you'd like. But for me, that's a little old fashioned and not as efficient as it really could be. The other option is making shell temporaries that would get relined the day of your preparation to fit your preparations. They're pre-made. You've got some seating guides, as you can see there, the palate and the lingual of the teeth uh, to make sure that you're preserving the position and the vertical of the wax up itself. Or the other option is looking at making direct to preparation temporaries where you're taking your wax up the day you prepare and you're essentially making crowns um, out of 3D printed material for your temporaries, just like you would make your finals. It's gonna allow perfect replication of your wax up and perfect prototyping of aesthetics, phonetics, and function in your patients so that you know when you go to finals, you're super happy. This is a case of mine. Um, we did upper and lower arch, but I'm just going to show the lower arch, uh, the upper arch here. So this is the preparation. You can see everything is nice and retracted. And this is one of the big keys and things to think about with 3D printing, maybe compared to how you were taking impressions with analog. So if you've done uh, impressions for full mouth dentistry analog, if you're and you're using the two core technique. One thing that you know, right, is as soon as you start pulling that cord out, the tissue starts collapsing back on your margin. So as you're pulling your top cord, your, your assistant is in there squirting impression material around those margins so it doesn't collapse back and occlude it. That's why I don't really believe the two cord technique is the most appropriate technique for doing interoral scanning margins. I also don't think copper cap and some of those other um, you know, aluminum chloride type techniques work as well either. Typically what I'm doing is I'm packing a cord and I'm leaving it in place for scanning so that I know the tissue won't rebound. Because really what you need is you need vertical, you need tissue retracted below the margin and horizontal, you need tissue attract, uh, retracted away from the margin to get really nice scans. So it'll be very easy for you to mark margins or your lab and they won't hate you because they're spending three hours trying to find your margins. Then you can print your temporaries. These were printed on the Sprint Ray Pro 55S and characterized a little bit. And this is the beauty of this type of workflow where you're just dropping these in. You're not doing any adjustments. The bite's perfect. The aesthetics are perfect. The phonetics are perfect. It's so easy to deliver these temporaries. I could never go back to making Visagrill temporaries again. This is what they look like fully delivered, upper and lower, after a month. 
And we ended up finishing this case in zirconia, and that's what our finals look like for the upper. Keys for success with this type of workflow. You have to have an accurate design that is realistic for you to prep to, and then you need to prep to that using some type of preparation guide. Um, retraction, like we talked about, you really need to retract the tissue away and get a very good scan. And proper post-processing, just like anything else, you need the cure unit that goes with your actual printer. If you want to learn more details about some of the workflows that I've talked about in this talk, um, come join us for some of our classes. So Occlusion Track is what I teach. We're basically focused on full mouth dentistry, digital design, and 3D printing. Um, the 3D printing track is one that Wally and I teach that's focused on all the applications of 3D printing that you can use in your office and some of the super exciting things like veneers and mock-ups that really can change the way that you do dentistry. This is my team and I certainly wouldn't be as successful or as sane or as happy as I am without them. And so I definitely want to shout out them. Um, you know, it's just going to work with a great team is something that really cannot be undervalued, I don't think. And I'm just very, very thankful for having a great team behind me. This is how you can get in touch with me. If you find that you have questions later on, follow me on social. Uh, that's probably the fastest and easiest way to get in touch with me or there's my email, you can certainly email me questions as well. Just want to thank Henry Shine again for having me for this webinar so that I could share some of the super exciting things that we're doing in our practice. And now I think we're going to spend some time taking some of the questions that you guys may have had from the presentation, but thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, doctor. That was a wonderful presentation. Sorry, I was on mute there for a moment, but I think you could see me. Um, yeah, really wonderful information. And uh, we already have some questions that have come in. Um, in the meantime, I, if anybody else has questions, we'd love to invite you to enter them into the chat box at the bottom of our screen. Um, and let's see what we have here. Okay. And uh, yes, so the first one is uh, from a Dr. Giovanni. Hi, Mike. Greetings from Italy. It's night here, but I couldn't miss the chance to listen to your webinar. So someone very grateful to listen to your webinar, Dr. Diffie. And then there's also from Dr. Singal. What factors should be considered while buying a 3D printer? Um, I, I think there are several factors you want to consider when you're buying a 3D printer. One, what are you most passionate about and what, what are the, the indications that you really want to bring 3D printing into your office? Because anytime you do something new in your office, it's a learning curve, right? And so that's why I tell people to start with something you're passionate about at first. So if it's occlusal guards, I think any of the printers that we talked about, you know, would be acceptable and could work really well for you. If you're looking at doing same day veneers or mock-ups, uh, you know, Sprint Ray probably is the best printer to, to buy at this point for that type of stuff. The other thing you need to look at is the resin, resins that are validated on the printer as well, because the hardware or the actual printers themselves you know, we're very quickly getting to a point where we're probably not going to be making huge innovations or jumps in uh, improvements there, but the resins are going to continue to improve. And so you want to invest in an ecosystem where new resins are going to be coming online and the newest chemistries and improvements are going to be made there. So, you know, to kind of sum it up, I think I would look at the indications that you want and then match the speed of the printer to what you're trying to do. First, and then second, I would look at the resins that are available on the printer and if there's new ones being validated and added to the list that are printable on that printer regularly, because those are the biggest things that will determine your success. Thank you, doctor. This next question from Dr. Mayank Takar, is, Formlab, is the Formlab printer an open system? It's a semi-open system currently. I, I know there's, um, it, it's interesting. I saw an advertisement. I haven't had time to follow up that they were going to be opening up 
to a lot more third-party resins on the Formlab systems. But for now, I would not call it an open system, no. Okay, and this uh, next question from Dr. Matt Klein. Please list sprint ray materials for all types of prints. I guess they're asking if... That's a, that's a long list, can, but I'll try to do it. That's I a long history. list. Yeah. So, the, the, their 50 plus percent filled resin is currently Ceramic Crown. Um, Onyx Tough 2 is their aesthetic resin and what we use a lot for veneers and for mock-ups. For denture base, they have Apex Denture Base. For denture tooth, they have Apex Denture Tooth. For Night Guards, they have uh, Night Guard Flex 2. For model, they have stone model and die model two um that's probably the only ones that i have ever actually used in practice i'm certain they have others um i use onyx tough two for all of my all onyx prosthetics and for my full mouth temporaries as well um i think if you're using those you probably don't need any other ones but i know they have other ones in their profile i just don't use them regularly or know them right offhand Thank you, Doctor. Uh, oh, this other one from Dr. Matt Klein. How often do you change your al alcohol in your wash step? Um, so for the Sprint Ray system, they have a uh, they use a specific gravity meter in, within the the Pro Wash that tells you when you need to change it. We print a lot, so honestly, we're ending up changing probably once a week or more often. Um, but if you're using the Sprint Ray Pro Wash, then it, it should tell you when you need to change. Um, when you do change though, you need to make sure, especially if you're printing with a lot of the uh, more filled resins like Onyx Tough 2, uh, Ceramic Crown's not supposed to be washed in the uh, Pro Wash, but some of the other ones also have ceramic particles. You need to clean all of that out of your, um, your uh, alcohol reservoirs so that it, it's not contaminating the way the specific gravity gets measured. So make sure you like scrub the bottom of it um, to make sure you're getting the most uh, lifespan out of the alcohol itself. Okay, this next question, can an immediate provisional all on X be printed with Sprint Ray Pro 95s, same day as surgery? And are photogrammetry dongles required? I have Trios 3, Itero 5D Plus Prime Scan. Um, if you're trying to print same day, then you need some way to convert, right? So you need to take your wax up and adapt it to where your implant locations are. Um, it's very hard to, to use an interall scanner to, to do a scan same day uh, accurately for a number of reasons, because there's blood everywhere. Um, and skin, most scan bodies are very hard to scan anyway. Um, I use photogrammetry for those type of workflows. Uh, I have the iCam here, but PIC or uh, Micron Map are also good systems to use. Um, and then you would need to convert that either with ExoCAD or uh, Three Shape. You could also do it there. You could have a lab, uh, you know, a designer do it for you. I have not actually tried to print that on the 95, but I've printed on the 55 many, many times accurately. I do that a lot, um, but I, I don't see why. I think the 95 should be accurate enough for that indication as long as things are nested properly. Um, I haven't personally tried it though. Okay, thank you. Um... Dr. Keith Kennedy, just to comment here, uh, he just got done with patients and would like to watch this presentation. Is there, recording, is there a recording I can watch? Yes, Dr. Kennedy, we will. We are recording tonight's presentation and we will be sending it out uh, to everyone who's registered here over the coming week. So you will be receiving a copy of this recording. Um, another question that's come in, how much does the ExoCAD software cost? Um, that's distributor dependent, um, and they also sell different modules depending on if you're trying to get a full suite or just focus on specific things. Um, I don't, am not close enough to those prices to know if you're going to buy everything, which is what we use. It's called the, you know, the ultimate license, which has every module that the software has. It's like $12,000 or so, but you can certainly 
get into ExoCAD at a much slower price, but I'd recommend reaching out to a distributor. Um, I don't know if Henry, uh, Henry Shine doesn't distribute ExoCAD. Is that right? Um, I am not aware that they don't. Um, we, but this is a question we can ask and get back to get back to um, you and Dr. Kekar. Okay, this next question, Dr. Sangal, can you please explain the use of Lucia jig in the all on X case? Um, so if you're, uh, Lucia Jig really is for getting a centric relation bite record. So it depends on what your plan is and like where you're trying to restore with your posterior reference point, right? So if you're doing it all in X and you want to use your posterior reference as centric relation um, at a specific vertical, uh, at an open vertical, then you would use the Lucia Jig technique that I showed for the uh, bite record and you would grind the platform with a burr um, to get the actual vertical dimension that you wanted to restore at. Uh, what you could find is if you're not opening up a decent amount is that you would have to grind so much on the platform or where the lower teeth meet that it would break in half. In that case, you'd probably use a different technique, which would be uh, like a leaf gauge technique and you would index that or lock that in with like triad or bite registration material and scan at that. Um, I didn't obviously show that in this presentation, but it is uh, a technique that I use for uh, cases where I'm not opening the vertical as much. Um, but it, it's also a well-established way to get centric relation. Um, and that's kind of how you would use that for your all on X planning. And then you would do your scans, upper and lower arch at the vertical that you want with that centric relation record, wax up to it. And then that would be what you would use for your restorative uh, wax up. Thanks, Dr. Diffie. And here uh, is another question in terms of how you bill. Do you bill as inlay onlay or is there a separate code for the 3D printed inlay onlay? It depends on what material you're using. Um, we're a fee for service practice. Um, so we we're, uh, if you're billing as, uh, if you're doing an out of sprint race ceramic crown or rodent sculpture two, uh, which are more highly filled resins, and you would bill it as a resin ceramic uh, inlay only, depending on the surfaces, obviously. Uh, if you're using Onyx Tough or Rodent Titan, which is another patented resin, um, which are filled, but uh, only in the like 40% range, then you would need to bill that uh, as an indirect fabricated uh, composite uh, inlay only. I, I don't know those uh, CDT numbers offhand, but that that's how you would bill that. Thank you, doctor. This next question from Dr. Alt. What are you using for temporary delivery, bonding and looting cement? Um, for full arch cases, uh, when I'm delivering full arch to temporary, so I'm typically making those in sextants or, you know, posterior segments and anterior segments. Um, and so I typically use a resin-based cement. Uh, Timrex makes a good one, or you can use uh, what you would use for a permanent based resin cement, just don't do etch and bond. I want something that's going to be sealed really tightly because um, usually for full arch cases, I'm going to leave the patient in temporaries for a minimum of one to two months to make sure that the function is fully uh, equilibrated. They're not going to have problems. The temporaries are going to stay on. So I know that everything's really perfect for how it needs to be. And so I want the margins really sealed perfectly. Uh, you could use temporary cements as well. Um, what I would worry about that is that, if, especially if you're going to use the leave them in temporaries for longer, is that you'll get marginal leakage, and you know it would potentially, if the preparations are closer to the pulp, you could have pulpal pathology, or you could get recurrent decay if the patient's diet is not great, um, even over a short period of time. But for me, I, I use resin-based uh, dual cure cement. Um, Timorex, like I said, or I use Ivoclar's uh, Verilink as well uh, a lot for those type of cases. Um, so it's it's locked in there more like a permanent. So I'm actually fully, fully prototyping like I would for my finals with the same cement. The material is just different than what the finals would be. 
doctor. This next question from Dr. Reeb. What, oh, sorry, uh, from Dr. Klein. Do you have experience with using XNAV? Does it include photogrammetry? I do not have the experience with XNAV. I am pretty sure they do have photogrammetry with that system now, though. Great. And this last question from Dr. Justin Reeb, what resins do you recommend for spider partials and flippers? Um, for partials and flippers, we're typically doing those out of Onyx Tough 2. Um, if we're on the Sprint Ray system, if you're on another open system that doesn't have Sprint Ray resins, then I would recommend Rodent Titan for those. Okay, wonderful. Well, with that, uh, that is the end. Uh, that That is our last question. So, um, doctor, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Diffie, for leading this really wonderful presentation. And thank you all for joining us. We did record tonight's webinar, as I said at the top of the hour, and we will be emailing the recording out sometime in the next week. We'd also appreciate your feedback via our survey that's going to pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you so much, Dr. Dufy. That was really great. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Really great to spend the night with you guys. Thank you.